test. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Great. Thank you. All right, so thank you guys all for coming back to the second day of Be Quick. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Chris Irvin. Uh, a variety of stuff I do at uh, Bristol, but I do have my toe in industry, which is sort of uh, very appropriate these days uh, with more and more quantum startups spreading up. It's the hot term in Silicon Valley. So um, today's the, or at least this morning, is the industry session. Um, lots of great talks set up, and the first is going to be Andy Collins uh, helping us live a little vicariously through some of the key tech fellows. The one thing just to mention, uh, the blatant advertising on your seat is for a four-day quantum MBA. Uh, I just attended one of these for Briz Symbio, and it was fabulous. So if there's any students in the room or postdocs, it's ridiculously cheap and ridiculously good if you want to get a taster for what it is to start up a, a company. Anyways, with no further ado, Andy. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. Okay, it's on. Okay, so um, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, who is familiar with the Quantum Technology Enterprise Center in this room? That's actually really heartening to see. That's great. Fantastic. So I'll just give you a quick overview of who we are and where we sit, and a bit about what we're trying to achieve. And, and, um, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is what I've seen in my experience since I came on board with this program in terms of watching academics make that transition to being entrepreneurs. And there's a lot of assumptions that certainly, uh, as an ex-academic myself, I came into this field, and that, that is in terms of entrepreneurship, thinking that the route to commercialization would be. And most of those were wrong. I was very pleasantly surprised. Just to give you an overview of who we are and what we offer, we are a, a partnership between University of Bristol and Cranfield. We're part of the, the UK national program. So we're not inherently, although we are based in Bristol, we, we want to work for everyone. And we want to try and help everyone make that transition and do what we can for that. We offer fellowships. So they're one year long fellowships where you get funding and, and paid to basically spend a year trying to develop and commercialize your idea or your science as a business or a company and become a startup. We give you travel budget, we give you support, and we give you MBA level training and consumables budget. So there's a lot of training involved. And I'll take you through sort of the roadmap of, of what that looks like. But most importantly, and this is different to many of the talks that you'll see this week, I'm going to talk about people, and that's something that has come forward and it's very loud and clear. It's all about the people when you're working on entrepreneurship and indeed in science as well. It's about your networking, uh, about talking to people, about getting those ideas. So it is a good time to be an entrepreneur. This is something I borrowed from Chris from his slide. A few years ago, there were a few companies that had aspirations to work in, in, with the field of, of quantum technology. We have some big investments um, and, and obviously Microsoft are here today as well. Looking at the area of computing and making big investments in the field of computing and algorithms because a, that could be very transformative in society. And lots of companies have started to follow on from there. So now is a really good time to be in this space. And a lot of these broadly fall into the category of computing. More recently, there's lots of consultancy about the kind of algorithms you can run on these machines. There's a lot of metrology and control equipment technology going into that as well. So at the moment it's all a bit lab based, but I'm going to talk a bit about some of the companies that are going to have a, a more lasting impact in the short term. And I'm not talking about the big quantum computers or the big ticket items, smaller things that have an impact that some of our fellows are taking out there. So um, this is our team and a major point I want to um, talk about. There's a few assumptions that we have. This is our first year. You'll see Chris is there as our deputy director. Um, there's me, there's Jane Garrett, who's a major driving force. So she's the deputy director of uh, Enterprise and is experienced at uh, building startups. So she, she's taken things to IPOs and things like that. Yuri Anderson, who's our entrepreneur resident. So he's, he's been there, he sits on people's shoulders and helps them. And Neil Carhart, who is here today, who's our systems engineering lead, helping people to integrate their technology into those existing sort of ecosystems. So where's it going to sit, communication, something like that. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that um, one of the assumptions people have is, okay, first of all, if I start up a company, will I lose my house? Uh, no, you won't. It doesn't work that way. I want to just put that right up front now. If you're doing it properly, <coughs> the advice and guidance you'll get from, from not just us, but any ecosystem you operate in, your technology transfer offices will be able to give you incredible amounts of advice. Um, there are ways to do this so that it's more like a normal job except you're going to be your own boss 
And you can do this uh, at not that much personal risk. People want companies to succeed. There is a wealth of support out there. One of the other assumptions is, am I going to go it alone? Will it just be me in a dusty office? Again, no. I can speak on behalf of Bristol. We've got lots of incubator programs here. We've got lots of scale-up capacity. I, I think Musty, if Musty, if you put your hand up, Musty will be talking a bit later about the new Quantum Innovation Centre that's being set up here in Bristol and will be online by the end of the year. And it's not just in the quantum space, but any idea you have, there's lots of support available. Set squared, and it's not just true of Bristol, it's true of wherever you are in the universities you're operating. People are willing to give you time and talk to you. And just as an aside, again, this is about things that I've seen just in this past two years I've been working with this program. Um, for example, we had Jamie Urquhart, one of the founders of ARM, come in, and he gave us a full day talking to us and training us and talking to the fellows about what it took to build up that company. And this was during the snowstorms, so he could have been sealed into Bristol permanently, but he stayed uh, just just to impart his knowledge. And this is, he's not doing too badly. He could have just sort of stayed at home, but he's got a passion for it. And I think one of the other principal reasons you would do this is why would I do this? Why would I take... Um, in the words of, of Nikaya, who I sort of interviewed for this talk, why would I do this? Why would I take this risk? Why would I leave academia? Well, it's about having a passion about something. None of the people, none of our fellows started up because they want to be super mega eye-wateringly rich. They started up because they have a passion about their science and it can have a potential impact on people and they, were, they want to take it forward. They want to see it out there that is in a way beyond just papers and publications and the normal academic group. They want to build a company work with people and actually take that technology out into society where it's got an impact. So I think that was just one of the major things. And also, will I lose contact with science? Absolutely not. You, you, if anything, you'll be working more with people. So on our fellowship programme, you'll arrive, you'll explore your idea and actually think of it in terms of where's the impact, where can it make a difference? And that's one of the major things. If there's nothing else you take from this talk, you might be working with a wonderful technology, but where's the human impact of that? And I'll come on to that a bit later. And then you might have to pivot. Your idea is sometimes you do an experiment and it doesn't work out. Well, a negative data point is still a data point. That's still a result and it tells you something about where you should be working or what you should be doing. For example, we have a very good lecture come in from uh, uh, the guy who was in charge of the project. He was the project manager for the first 2G video phone, and it bombed. And he actually got a promotion after this bomb. This was back in 1999, because this technology was not there. It wasn't well developed, it was glitchy, and it was rubbish. And when they released it, they actually kept these handsets under the counter so people couldn't see them. And he gracefully killed that project off and got a promotion. That's a good story because the code that they wrote to try and cope with that pitiful bandwidth of 2G actually went on to help iTunes get set up when iPods came out. And there was a spin-out company from that. So that was another, it's just a quick example of a pivot of how you can take, you can salvage something from any wreckage, ideally. We don't set out to have wreckages, I'll just point that out. <laughs> So what will you be doing in five months, eight months, and 12 months? So one year is a very tight turnaround. One thing I would say is that we try to plan to help people be on that 12-month cliff. So I'll be talking today about Nikaya and Zhao, just two of our fellows. Um, we had four in our first year. We've got six in our current year. You'll be planning and you'll be prototyping. So having some bench space, we give you bench space, is invaluable. Having someone you can work with to actually develop a prototype. Now when I say prototype, I mean a, a working widget that you can put in front of people and actually test with someone. Not just you thinking this is a great thing, but something that you can give to someone. We train people in finance and actually how to do financial projections. So you get a whole new skill set on top. And really, the, the, the money is a very important thing when you're trying to start a company. That's the lifeblood. And you're developing a product. Again, think about what's the impact? Why is someone going to use this? When I'm using my phone, why do I like using it so much? It's because they've designed it that way. They've tried to make it easy to use. Most things don't have instructions man instruction manuals now because they're ergonomic. So will it fit seamlessly into wherever you're trying to sell it? And then you start to get the exciting stuff. You go to a pitch. We're all focused about the pitch. So here's Chris, um, this is our Kelty Investor Day. You have a board, a team, you start to get employees. So the two fellows I'll be talking about, they already have employees. And this is just after, um, this is only 18 months down the line from when they joined us. They now have companies and employees. I'm not going to dwell on the results. 
but we have had three incorporated companies and one consultancy so far, and we've managed to gain bids. Now, one of the important things is Innovate UK has been extremely brilliant about this, and, we, uh, and one thing I want to say is go for the grants, go for the support that you can, because it's helped our fellows go out to investors and say, well, look, I have this amount of money, and if you just invest 100K, 200K, we've got a full operational company that has input from academic partners. And that goes a long way. And, and that's not too dissimilar from the grants you already write, I'm, I'm sure. And so here's Nakaya. So uh, I'll tell you about some of the downs as well. Um, and because Nikaya uh, was facing, uh, he didn't have a visa. He also had a baby during the, well, his wife had a baby during the program. Um, so, and I want to sort of put that in the context that you, you might imagine that being an entrepreneur is super, super stressful. And it can be, but if you manage your time and you're driven and you're passionate about something, then you've still got time for all of this other stuff. Going out, you know, getting married, getting a house, applying for your visa, getting a job, that, that, well, not your job is, to build the company, but um, so here's the kind with Jane. Um, here's his prototype. This is what he came in with, and just to take you through some of his journey for it, he started to go and explore what he thought the application would be. So it's using a single photon detector that's extremely sensitive to look for the fluorescent uh, flash uh, when bacteria is present. And he thought, okay, I can do that in wastewater. So he went out and spoke to people. And he spoke to customers who, um, again, something that I would recommend when you're going to talk about your idea, when you're going to talk to people about these things, get an idea of where it can have an application and talk to as many customers as you can. So Bristol uh, Set Squared runs a project called iCure where you get lots of funding. I think it's, Chris, is it about, it's about 20,000 pounds, something like that. 50,000 pounds to, to fly wherever you want in the world and talk to potential customers and really thrash out your idea. And there are schemes like that all over, all over the UK. And during, he was talking to someone at the, the water board when in the middle of giving a pitch about this technology, when the chap he was talking to started to have what looked like a heart attack. Um, so Nikaya called an ambulance, ambulance turned up, helped the guy, he's, he's fine now, it wasn't a heart attack, it was, it was something else. But, but Nikaya went back again and so there's a lot of traveling, a lot of talking to people and, and spoke to him and they refined the idea. Now, during that time, the network, we said, well, where's Bigham? Water's a good market, but where's Bigham? Where can it have a bigger impact? And it turns out there was some technology over in chemistry with fluorescent dots that could adhere to specific bacteria with antigen recognition. Now, those are fluorescent quantum dots. You've got a single photon, highly sensitive photon detector. So they coupled it together and they made a collaboration and put it for a grant. And now you can see that his applications of biotechnology, this is lifted from his website. So he sort of had a bit of a pivot and said the market's bigger over here. He refined a prototype. He actually, during the, during the sessions, uh, that's sort of all the modeling and that's where your prototyping comes in, it's very important. Um, he hired a member of staff. Now that didn't work out. It turns out that the member of staff he hired just wanted to do a bit of programming rather than develop an FPGA board to put this in the prototype. So there's some ups and downs, but during that you learn how to talk to people, you manage them out of the company, and you work out, well, who do we actually need for our team? And so he, he got a visa as well by this point, um, a, a tier one visa to stay, so that's good. But he refined his product to the point that and this is the important thing, what's it going to do for other people? By the time you get to your pitch, it's not enough to talk in the same scientific terminology and say, well, it's a fantastic single photon source that does this within these parameters. It's not a scientific talk. It's a presentation of what it's going to do for your client, customer, or investor. And he boiled the whole thing down to high-speed bacteria detection. And when he went up and gave his pitch, it was a one-line solution. We're developing technology to enable users to identify bacteria in five minutes as opposed to two to five days. So this is for detecting blood sepsis, is the end application. Now, there's nothing in there is mentioned about quantum. The technology might actually scare people. And investors and clients, they're going to assume that you're, you're the smart person in the room. You're the technical lead. You know what you're talking about. So they want to know what it's going to do for them. And it's a thousand times faster and five times cheaper. We just boil the whole thing down. Okay, seven minutes, great. Um, the other thing, the team. Something we see is that people have a very hard time relinquishing control of their technology to others. Letting other people work on it, letting other people develop it or refine it. Um, that, that seems to be something you want to, it's human to want to retain control over your baby, over your thing. But actually, Nikaya has really taken off. 
So his, his wife actually um, is his CTO. She helped um, develop the programming, did, did the FPGA in the end. And then a team gets built up around this. You're not going to be an expert in finance, and it can waste all of your time building up the spreadsheets for that. So you concentrate on what you're good at and surround yourself with a really talented team, and you'll find the results go much quicker. I, I, can't, I can't stress that enough. Get a, get a good team behind you. So this is uh, Nikaya's feedback. Building the business is not an art. It's not a hand waving thing. You get people who are good at it, you get people who are bad at it, but there's a process to it. It can be achieved through a process that really helps. That's a quote from the client. So you can follow a process, you can follow advice and do it. Um, a bit of, a, bit of an ad for QTech there, but QTech has captured what investors are looking for. And that's basically about taking your technology, turn it into a message, turn it into why is it going to help the person you're trying to sell that technology to. Um, Nikolai got more money than was required in the end to uh, support himself, so that was fantastic. So he's got this company off the ground, he's got employees now, he's got space at UniDX, it's up and running, it's happening. And access is crucial, lab space, um, a desk space, a phone, things like that. You, 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 it takes effort to get there. So I just want to go on to Nikolai, so here, here's, uh, sorry, uh, to Zhao. So some of you will know Zhao. Uh, he has a gas sensing or methane detection technology that can detect methane at range. And this is Yuri Anderson, he's our entrepreneur residence and now he's a board member and partner with Zhao as well. Again, arrive, explore, pivot. Um, so in academia, sort of you're, you're in your comfort zone, but you have to know what you're doing it for. And again, Zhao mentioned to me when we were talking about this stage, talking to people was one of the most important things. So we do a lot of systems engineering. So Neil, who's up at the back, Neil puts his hand up there. Um, this is a rich picture, and you'll see that the actual technology is the quantum tech. His quantum tech is actually a very small part of this rich picture. He's a crying earth because oil leaks bad, uh, and methane explosion. And, and I really like this picture because it just shows there's loads of other stuff that you've got to think about. It's actually a very complex picture when you're trying to put a company together, but there's a lot of help to do that. So it's thinking about the legal implications of what you're doing. Um, Will it fit? Is there a market for it? What ecosystem will it fit into? Who needs methane gas detection? Well, oil companies need it. And just a bit about refining it. So this was from an early pitch that Zhao gave. And of course you're enthusiastic about the technology, you have a passion for it. Brilliant. I, I, know, I know everyone in this room can say, oh yeah, it's like a LiDAR, but it detects, it detects the absorption of methane. Clearly, that's, it, there's a formula on it, it's great. That's not what matters to the people you're trying to sell this to. Again, they want to know what it's going to do for them and where the impact is. So we had to flip that sort of scientific aspect around because to you, you the brilliance of your technology is self-evident because you love it and you've been working on it, um, but other people have a hard time seeing that. So in the end, advanced solutions for rapid and accurate natural gas leak detection, quantum light metrology, that's his company. That's the one line of what he's selling there. There was no quantum in it, there's a cube. Um, and what he went with when he went to that, um, they call it a value proposition, he sold it based on an explosion, methane blowing up. This was a leak. And also there was a value, $1.6 billion in fines. So wouldn't your company like a way of detecting this quickly that costs you know, a few hundred thousand maybe, and then you won't have to pay a massive fine. But something like, this was the actual picture he used in the, in the sales pitch. And you can see that this very, very cool gentleman here just walking slowly away from the flames <laughs> when the professional firefighters are running. Um, so that was, I thought that was a really good value proposition from Zhao, and it worked. We have three investor days that we finish off our year with. And here's Zhao with Yuri talking to a, a, an investor. Um, and now he has a board, he has a team, he has employees. He has premises, so he's working down at Unit DX. So we try to manage that transition so the company's up and running. So it's possible. And Zhao also um, has had a daughter during this period as well. So there's, so we're doing really well for babies coming out of the program as well, which is good. Um, we're very happy with that. But it's, it, it's not as difficult as you think. It's not going to be as hard as you think. So um, you know you've made it when you've got a, a branded mug. Um, this is the thing at Unit DX at the moment. So and it's just a word about marketing as well. Um, have a message, have a theme, have a brand, have a problem you're trying to solve and everything else will follow from that. And, and be confident in what you're putting across. You do have a solution, you might have something good. So advice from Zhao um, is he's had staffing troubles as well. He had an argument with a guy called Monash 
um, at Cranfield who's going to be sat on his board. Um, just as a sideline, always check your emails if you're forwarding them because some, some rude words were said about um, this chap's abilities and they got tagged on the bottom of a forwarded email that got sent to him. Or just small, small details, but it does feed into what you would class as a professional conduct, which I'm sure you'll all have anyway, but the more you, the more you work on that kind of professionality, uh, the easier it's going to be to connect with these networks and get these things out there. It's just as a, a small aside. Um, so Zhao's words of wisdom on all of this, um, academic life is not for every postdoc, but every postdoc has a niche knowledge which could be an opportunity, so I invite you to explore that. And just take some time to explore what you have in terms of where it can go. Not everyone in this room will stay in academia. Many of you, and this is just the statistics of it, will go off into some kind of business. You might be hired by a company, you might start your own company, but wherever you, you end up, um, these are all skills you can take with you when you go there and you can make a difference. You'll always have to talk to someone about why your science is important and what an impact it can make. So just take the time to explore that. And finally, just as a bit of a pitch, we've got a quantum startup week where we invite everyone to join us for a week. Um, we, there's a minimal buy-in fee, but we can waive that. We do have um, free scholarships available where you can just explore what you're doing, even if you don't have an idea, and see where it might potentially have an impact and talk to other people where you might have a good collaboration come together. So I think that's... On the dot. On the dot, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. We've got five minutes for questions. The first one of the day is always uh, hard to get over. Who is your question for? I'm gonna ask one. Oh, uh, the boss has got both. Go for it. So? Is the program just for those who have PhDs, or would you encourage master students to go for it as well? Anyone, really. I mean, we, we, we our whole purpose is to try and set up companies and help people start those companies up and those ecosystems up. We we are also open to any idea where we come out to, to you or to anyone here and bring those skills and bring the EIRs and bring the advice with us. So, so masters will be free to apply as well. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to ask, when's the next intake? December the 1st. And um, adverts will be going up for the next fellowships uh, within the month. Hi. David Shaw, Park of Sinsight. You, uh, the examples you all gave were hardware-oriented products. Yes. Is the program also open to service ideas? Software service as well as consultancy? Yes, very much so. So we, we have uh, two consultancy, well we have one consultancy company from last year's intake that's doing quite well at the moment and we also have uh, one consultancy company that's working on security based ideas at the moment. We, we are, we're happy to support anything, so I, I just say we don't take any equity from our companies. We just want to get this whole ecosystem off the ground so we're open to all ideas and as you've seen sort of some of the companies there, they're all very, a lot of them are consultancy based at the moment, that seems to be where the, the ideas are. I think the consultant from last year got uh, kudos from Innovate UK as one of the best run projects. So, yeah. yeah. Chris? Andy, um, outside Cambridge and London, the biggest complaints of companies starting up is difficulty in finding um, particularly non executive directors and experience that to work with. I mean, you know, unless you're in a cluster set, typically like London and Cambridge, it's a really it's a common. Is there anything you specifically do to do something like that? Yes, so we have, um, Jane has been instrumental in setting up uh, investor lists and alongside that the kind of coaching list. So we've, we've tried to coax some of the coaches and mentors out of Cambridge. We actually have a mentorship program, so Neil, uh, again Neil if you put your hand up, Neil's responsible for our mentorship program. So we have a number of business leaders, so for example Murray Reid, who was the former CTO of Gucci Housego, is on board as one of our mentors and helping right now. And we're trying to bring those people in from all over. Um, not just sort of the Cambridge under the, or the Golden Triangle, as they call it, but we're bringing in, we, we've got about, how many how many mentors do we have now? Yes? Five, yeah, from across the board, and they in turn have investor links, so we're doing very well in attracting investors, so um, we've got links to Silicon Valley Bank, who've been inviting people along, so Bristol is actually a pretty good cluster for that kind of investment, and startup support as well, and they've got a big mentorship program here um, as well. Yeah. How do you make money if you don't take equity? 
Um, well, that's that's the magical. Well, we are, we are part of the national program, so we are we are in a very lucky position, and, and this is something I want to highlight. Right now, the UK um, there's a there's a the the consultant that was <coughs> mentioned earlier is Matt Picard, who, who may or may not already be here. But Matt was part of a project that was looking at single photon sources in the market for that. And one of the quotes in the room, or something that came up out of exploring that when we were doing a workshop on it, was that the UK enjoys probably the best linked up supply chain strategy for quantum technology anywhere in the world. We are the envy of um, certainly the US, coming from one person from the US who was talking about that, and that we're ahead of the curve on that. And that's because there is a, the, the, the UK strategy has extremely strong links between government, um, the funding bodies, so we are funded by EPSO, so that, that's where our money comes from at the moment, and our whole thrust is to try, so the companies that surround it, everybody talks to everyone else, there's a lot of networking there, there's a lot of support, and um, we, we're not making money, we're not doing it as a commercial thing, we're part of the program trying to drive and keep the UK ahead of the curve in terms of the level of talent and technology that's available in the UK. So that, that's where we fit. We are a skills hub, and we're helping people make that transition, be they PhD, masters, anyone with a good quantum-based idea, making it across that, that jump, that, those first initial steps, into becoming an industry themselves. You're welcome to come in, make a fortune, and buy us all yachts, though, if you want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we won't say no to money. <laughs> uh, time for one more question, if somebody's got a burning one. Maybe I'll just, oh, yeah, go for it. Is there anywhere else in the world you can go to do this? <laughs> uh, no, currently, no there isn't, but there will be a quantum innovation centre online soon, which is uh, which is very exciting and I recommend you all hear about that. So yeah, we are the only place that does this at the moment, so it really is, if you want to start up a company now, we are here, we have at least 10 fellowships every year, now is, now is the time to do it. You will, I, I think we offer a level of support that nowhere else does at the moment, you will never get a better deal than this. So with that, let's thank Andy again.